We'll be moving on now to a macroeconomic overview, which will look at the oil and gas downturn and its impact on Nigeria and, the, and Ghana real estate markets. This will be presented by Dr. Andrew S. Nevin, advisory partner and chief economist, PwC West Africa. Um, Andrew, I'd like to welcome you on stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Let me just uh, try to get a better background. I'm sorry, I usually use the virtual background. There we go. We have a little bit of, um, of, uh, of, of, of uh, sunlight here. Okay, welcome. Should you want me to just start talking? Yeah, go ahead. You can go okay. ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much to WAPI. I've been part of this for a few years. Uh, so much. So thank you so much to the Forum Group and Lucky Free Zone who are making um, some immense contributions to the economy in Lagos. I've been asked to talk about the Ni Nigerian economy and where it fits into Lagos. Uh, sorry, where it fits into the kind of future at this point for real estate. Excuse me if I look down occasionally and look at my notes. I might share a few slides. I have about 20 minutes if I understand right. Please stop me if, I'm, if I need to be exited off the stage. But let me start by saying, I mean, I think we're all very uh, aware of how challenging 2020 has been on many, many fronts around the world. Um, uh, we've had COVID, which is the biggest um, human uh, and economic uh, setback that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. We hope we never see anything worse. We've had um, uh, unrest around uh, the United States and challenges there and with the election. We certainly, well, I'm in London at the moment, heading back to Abuja soon, but we've certainly seen events in the UK um, challenging. And of course, we've had this, um, challenging events in, in Nigeria as well. So. But I want to give actually a very upbeat message in this um, in this uh, session today. Um, and despite all the challenges, uh, I have never been more optimistic about Nigeria than I am now uh, in the 12 years that I've been there. And I've never been more optimistic about the real estate uh, industry. Those who follow me know that we were the ones that said five years ago that real estate was the most important sector for Nigeria. And uh, you know, why did we say that? We said it because, to be honest, I usually say things when I get tired of hearing the wrong things, like uh, Nigeria is an oil economy. So we said it's not an oil economy, it's supported by the diaspora. But in this case, I got tired of hearing about people talking about agriculture, manufacturing, infrastructure. They're all important sectors. Every sector is important to Nigeria. But what we said very clearly starting five years ago, is that there is no successful path forward without a successful real estate industry. And the reason for that is, is simple. Two thirds of the world's assets are real estate. If you look at uh, economies that have done well, you can always find the role of real estate in it. For example, I'm Canadian. My parents bought a house in the 1960s. There's re really residential real estate drove this economic success of Canada and the United States in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so we put that front and center. And of course, we put out our, our, our paper last year on dead capital, which basically says Nigeria needs to unlock its dead capital, but particularly the real estate um, capital on that. So, so let me just share a few slides if I can get them up. I did a test run of the uh, technology. I hope it doesn't desert me. Let's see what happens um, uh, on here. So Sorry, can you see my screen? Uh, we can, yes. Okay, so let me, just a few things to, I just want to you know, share with people, and of course these are available. I just want to start out with the basic demographics of this, um, and, and uh, which is both you know, an advantage and a disadvantage from a strictly economic view, but I just want to remind everyone uh, here today of the, just the scale of Africa. And I, I really think globally we're kind of at a demographic inflection point. And, um, Sorry, Andrew, uh, would you just go full screen, please? Oh my God, it's just so many things for someone at my... Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Does that work? 
Um, yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the help at my age. So, yeah. So what I, uh, I, my first degree is in computer science. I started out using punch cards. So that's, that's just amazing. I can even do this. Okay. So just a reminder of um, just the scale of, of Africa on this. I mean, it's just, I mean, you can see all the countries fit in there. It always astonishes me to see this, uh, this sort of graphic. Of course, the Mercator projection makes northern and southern latitudes look bigger. I'm Canadian. It makes us look uh, enormous in Canada. It's not actually accurate, but what really gets me about this uh, this picture, of course, is that um, is that uh, Great Britain, uh, you know, can fit into Madagascar. So there you go. Okay. Now I talked about demographics on this. This just looks at the number of births, and the reason that we start with this point is the thing about demographics, of course, is it's slow moving, but it's um, basically almost certain uh, what the, the future of it. And you can see that in the 2015 to 2020 period, this is in five-year blocks, there's about uh, 40 million births in Africa um, and about 100 million births around the world. So already Africa is about 30% of the global births. But this number over the next decades get larger and larger and larger. And of course, you know, you may ask why we're looking out so far, but at the end of the day, real estate, particularly the environment with low interest rates, real estate is a very long-lived asset. And that's how the value real estate um, that's how real estate gets, you know, uh, uh, bought, sold, prices move, go up um, because of long-term trends. And the trend is just incredible in terms of this demographic shift, which I said, I really look at 2020 as an inflection point on that. And just looking specifically at Nigeria, this looks at the number of births. So you think of India and China as kind of the largest countries, you know, giants in the demographic terms. Um, and you see the number of births over a five-year period. Um, and you, you can see that this looks at it from 2015 to 2020, uh, the middle bar 2030 to 2035, and the outer bar a little bit later, 2045 to 2050. But, but the gap between Nigeria and India and China in terms of population growth is, is narrowing. And the other thing about this that you realize, you know, the long-term questions about real estate is, the population in India is going to start to decline. The number of births is declining. The population in China, the working age population, is already starting to decline. The number of births is declining. And in terms of demographic weight, I mean, obviously Europe has some, some uh, long-term strategic issues about its relationship with Africa. You can see, if you look on the far right-hand side, just in terms of demographic weight, how small Europe, European countries are. Now, to put this in perspective, I said there were 40 million births in Nigeria this year. There's going to be 5 million births in all, sorry, 7 million births in just Nigeria, four, 5 million births in all of Europe. Uh, which means there'll be, in 20 years, more Nigerian 20-year-olds starting to get economically active than all 20-year-olds in, in Europe. And just, you know, the reason for this is, is not a big surprise. Total fertility rate, everyone knows, um, 2.1 is about replacement. If you look at all the countries where this is below, uh, below replacement, and people, I mean, people understand Russia, um, uh, China, South Korea, Italy, Spain, Germany are below replacement fertility rates. So their populations will start to decline. In most cases, their working age population is already starting to decline. Um, but people may not be aware countries like uh, Brazil, for example, Colombia, Iran are already below population replacement rates, including India is just at right now population replacement rate fertility that's going to decline. And even Pakistan is heading in that same direction. Um, and globally, the number of working age adults and the number of children has actually peaked globally outside of Africa. That is, those two numbers are going to start to come down. And of course, when we translate this into total population, you can see on this graph just how rapidly we're heading to a situation where um, where, where Africa is just you know, a massive, demo, bigger and bigger demographic part of it, which at the end of the day is you know, very central for real estate investment on that. So just some, some background on, on where the world is going in that. As I said, I really think 2020 we're going to see is an inflection point of people understanding the demographics of Africa. Uh, and of course, Lagos is projected to become, let me skip a few, a few slides here. Um, Lagos is projected to become the most uh, populous um, city in the world by 2100. There's some, some estimates as high as uh, 88 million. I'm not sure that we'll reach 88 million. Um, I'm not sure that's desirable, but I mean, certainly uh, people should expect Lagos to be the largest, uh, economy, sorry, largest uh, population city in the world this, this century, which of course has huge implications for real estate. 
Then it, yeah, so now let's just turn to the Nigerian economy for a few minutes. Um, is a, and a, a couple of themes that we, so when we talk about the economy at PwC Nigeria, we are not really in the business of making pro projections about the, uh, especially about the future. Uh, we don't stand up and sort of project what the growth rate is going to be. Um, in fact, what the growth rate will be, GDP growth rate, what the success, economic success, social success of Nigeria is not known at the present time. It's really after the decisions made by certainly by the federal government, by the state governments, uh, by private sector, by NGOs, civil actors. I mean, the future of Nigeria is in the hands of, of Nigerians. But there's a few themes that we want to highlight in this in this session to get us started, um, all of which have an impact on uh, real estate. So let me just start with the power of the diaspora. Again, we put out these, these papers because uh, we, we find that the existing narrative is not correct. People talk about Nigeria being an oil economy. Uh, on this, I mean, at the end of the day, even if Nigeria pumps 2.1 million barrels of oil a day, that's 800 million barrels a, a year. That's 200 million Nigerians. That's four barrels per person. Uh, more than half of it goes to the IOC or lifting cost. Um, so, you know, to develop Nigeria, you've got about less than two barrels of oil per person, so less than $100. What really supports the Nigerian economy um, are the remittances. The official number from the um, World Bank is $25 billion in remittances. Uh, the unofficial number is really unknown. Many people, like myself, are paid in IRA. If I need uh, foreign currency, like Canadian dollars, I just do an informal exchange with someone. And why do I do that? Because it's quicker and cheaper to do the informal exchange. So these remittances are holding up the economy. In fact, the World Bank says that one half of Nigerians are touched by uh, remittances. Now, why does this matter for real estate? Because at the end of the day, a lot of the remitt people sending the remittances maintain very close ties to Nigeria, and they don't just want to send money for consumption, they want to send it for investment, particularly real estate investment. So one of the key uh, themes or challenges to the industry is to start to create products that appeal to the diaspora, which in include uh, things like you know having a, a structure to it, a surety, a principle, you know that you're getting your what you what you paid for. Um, with property management is a theme of this uh, um, uh, conference, and you know, in many cases, the 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 Astra want exposure to Nigerian real estate, but they also want to be able to rent it out and make sure that it's in good hands. So I think this is something that increasingly you're seeing. Uh, in the last year, uh, particularly after we put out our paper, the government, uh, state governments, uh, the banks, investment houses all take an interest up. But I think the real estate I industry also needs to create products that are going to appeal to the diaspora. I mean, so of these remittances, the uh, survey data shows that 30% of that $25 billion official number of people want to actually invest. And most of that investment they want is in real estate. Uh, I talked a little bit before we put out our paper on dead capital. For us, this is the number one issue in terms of uh, turning the economy around. Um, so we put out our paper, paper last year that discussed the scale of, of the issue and some of the ways forward. I mean, dead capital takes a number of forms, but the the, I won't, the majority of it, uh, I won't say the vast majority, but the majority of it is in real estate. Um, some of these um, assets are already owned by the government, for example, things like the National Theater or National Stadium, which are asset, very valuable assets but not currently producing a return. But the urgent task for Nigeria is to turn this dead capital, this dead real estate into live real estate. And part of that's the housing deficit. Uh, I think the 17 million is probably a little high. Even the World Bank has come back and scaled that back. It's probably more in the seven to eight million, but it's an enormous gap between what people want in terms of housing um, and what's what's available right now. And of course, we all you know understand the reasons for it. It has to do with land titling, with registration, with the complexity of um, being able to establish title, of being able to move title. Um, a lot of people working on the mortgage side. So I had those who heard me speak before. I think last year I mentioned I had a mortgage. I actually managed to pay off my mortgage, which was a very happy thing at 19% um, on that. But this, this issue of dead capital is now firmly on the government's agenda, both the federal government and the state level. 
Um, and I think you're going to see an acceleration of the of the real estate industry. Uh, and obviously, there are huge fortunes to be made by developers that can kind of tap 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 into it um, on on that. Um, and uh, so I just I put that out as something that the industry should also be contributing to the national debate and moving this in the right the right direction. There's some if you read our paper, there's some changes required in the land use act. But there's a lot of things that also need to happen to at the state level, which I'll, I'll come back to in a, in a moment. Um, related to this, I mean, I said I've never been more optimistic about Nigeria. Of course, I say that as also having been the one that stood up over the last few years and said Nigeria's got poor and poor in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. 2019, 2020, certainly probably in 2021, poor and poor per capita. Again, the reason I started to say this was if you go back to the 2017, 2018 period, um, Central Bank, the federal government was declaring victory in the economy because there was growth of 1% to 2%. Of course, the population growth is 3 to 2%. So I think we found it difficult to, to sit here, the federal government declaring victory when people were still getting poor and poor per capita. Um, and what you know? Why are they getting poor and poor per capita? I mean, there's many reasons for it, but this, for us, summarized kind of uh, in one chart what's going on in Nigeria up till now. This chart looks at the the using the economist term gross capital, gross fixed capital formation. Um, very simple rule: if you want to have a headline GDP growth, you need to have uh, investment in an economy. This shows for three countries: China, India, and uh, Nigeria. Uh, China's bar is the highest in the latter years. I think I'm one of those in the camp that says I think China overinvests in fixed assets. I'm not sure that's the right path. The middle bar, India, has had very good headline GDP growth. They invest roughly between 25 and 30 percent uh, of their GDP into um, into uh, gross capital fixed formation every year. And the lower bar is the Nigerian case now. Uh, it is a mathematical certainty that if you uh, invest at the rate that Nigeria does, which is about 16 to 19 percent the last few years, you'll only grow, even if you invest, you know, assuming you invest it properly, you'll only grow at, um, at uh, about 2 percent, which is below population growth. So it's an urgent issue for uh, Nigeria to get its investment rate up. And of course, that investment is not just foreigners. In fact, the first group that needs to invest are Nigerians, then the diaspora, and then after those two groups invest, certainly foreigners would probably participate as well. But the number one challenge we put to the federal government over the last few years is to say, look, we, we understand all your program trader money, anchor borrower, the CBN intervention programs, and you know, on the surface they sound useful, but at the end of the day, if you don't uh, get investment into the country, um, you're not going to you're not going to grow six to eight percent. And of course, the CBNs come out. The governor came out last year and said that we should be targeting double digit growth, headline GDP growth in Nigeria. That requires an investment rate of somewhere between thirty and thirty five percent, and we're not we're simply not getting it on that. On the other hand, the environment for investing in Nigeria is, I think, getting better. And I'll, you know, I'll summarize with a bit of a moment of truth talk. Um, but of course, a big part of this investment is in the real estate sector. So as, as Nigeria uh, hits its moment of truth, as I said, I've never been more optimistic. The opportunities for, for um, real estate are kind of infinite. Um, another theme that we've talked about, which I think is very relevant for this group, is, of course, um, subnational economic growth. So certainly, if you go back a decade, there was a, um, wasn't a lot of discussion about things that happened outside of Lagos and Abuja, and state governors did not take responsibility at their, at their local level. So we have said for a number of years there needs to be more focus on the state level. Um, and what has happened, in fact, is that this is now something I think that's well understood throughout the throughout the economy. So you have the federal government discussing it, which they would not have done five years ago, and actively pushing this agenda. And you have more and more state governors who really are kind of doing um, fantastic things in their state. I mean, to give one example, I did a session. Uh, last week, I guess, um, with a number of state governors. And um, on my panel was the His Excellency Governor Mohammed from Bauchi State, a state I didn't know very much about. But he, his command of the facts of the investment case in Bauchi, of where they needed investment, of the dead assets they had that they wanted to make live, what they wanted from investment partners, 
uh, what they were prepared to, you know, what they understood they had to provide to investment partners was just staggering. And I think His Excellency Governor Mohammed is an example of this new crop of governors on that. So just to name a few that I'm personally uh, familiar with that are very impressive, Governor Miami from uh, Equity State, again, a state you might not normally think of. He's the chairman of the National Governors Forum, um, doing just a fantastic job. Governor Abby Oden from uh, Ogun State, um, Governor Obaseki, who's had you know, some political challenges, but is really moving ADO forward. Um, and in fact, um, it's, it's uh, you know there's now this uh, project to put a, the Benin Museum in ADO, huge project there. But the reason I say this in this conference is I think from the viewpoint of the real estate industry, of course, there's always been a lot of focus on the Abuja and Lagos markets. But I think that real estate developers that can develop strength in um, in, uh, in, in particular states, state capitals, I could do extraordinarily well. If I go back for a moment to the um, Canadian example, I mean, when we, our, my parents bought a small house in a mid-sized town in London, uh, in, in London, Ontario, Canada, the house was made by a, what was effectively a local developer with a very strong position. So you had different, I mean, everyone in this session understands real estate's a very local business. So we had different developers in different parts of even the province, not even the, the country in Canada. And the people that, that developed real estate in a local market understood it so well, understood the demand, understood the buying power, understood the um, uh, the price points on that. So I, I do think that real estate developers who might have always been focused on Lagos should spend some time looking at some of the emerging states. Um, and, you know, as I said, I think they do extraordinarily well on that. Um, so let me, let me just stop there. Um, with, with the slides on that. Um, I think so, I, I, but overall, I think that, as I said, I, I wanna come with a very optimistic message and I think now is the time for, um, uh, for real estate developers to really step up in, in Nigeria. Um, and I think as well, I mean, one of the one of the things that's been raised as a theme for the conference is this kind of the mode of construction. And it's been on our mind for a while I think a lot of the real estate that's been, that I've been familiar with, uh, if I look at kind of Lagos or Abuja, to me is built in a, let's call it a Western centric way. It seems like it's more built for kind of a winter climate in, in Germany or the UK than adapted properly to Nigeria. So I do think one issue for the um, industry is you know what are the material local materials? What are the building techniques that are appropriate to the local climate? The heavy rainfall, um, you know, prone to flooding, et cetera. And I think that real estate developers that can kind of crack that um, that uh, a new way of building or proper way of building are going to do again extraordinarily well. And then the final thing I'll just I'll just sort of say here at this stage is. I think that, uh, you know, I've painted, as I said, I've never been more optimistic, but of course, you know, my optimism may turn out to be misplaced. As I said, the path for um, Nigerians is kind of up to Nigerians, and this is all the actors. And of course, the I think the NESG is still going on, or maybe just finished, but where the private sector and the public sector get together and discuss the economy. The vice president, you might have seen yesterday, vice president, His Excellency, um, Osimbajo came out yesterday, Prof. Osimbajo, and said that, that they're open to innovating thinking. And I think that for the success of the real estate industry, there's a need for the real estate industry to engage the, the, um, the, the public sector. They want to be engaged, but you need to play a role in, I don't want to call it lobbying, but in working with the, um, with the, with the public sector to you know, help unlock all this dead capital. On that, so you're not passive actors in an economy that's happening to you. Are active actors in in moving it forward, and I think if you play a big role in that, it will go a long way in ensuring that we can unlock the dead capital, that we can create huge value both for people that buy real estate, but also for developers to participate in developing the right kind of real estate. So it's really all up to you. So let me let me stop stop there. Um, I hope this has been interesting. Of course, the slides will be available for you on that. And God bless Nigeria.